Many uh, children of military families are receiving their care in private offices. The needs of these children and their parents may pose a challenge to pediatricians who are not knowledgeable of the military culture or distresses of deployment. We're pleased to have Dr. Jeff Hutchinson, a colonel in the U.S. Army and currently serving as the Chief of Adolescent Medicine at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. He has extensive experience in dealing with these problems and we look forward to his message and we look forward to learning things that will help military children who are caught in deployment. Dr. Hutchins. Thanks, sir. I am so excited to be here today. <laughs> To talk to you about military children in a private practice is my goal. This is my obligatory disclosure slide saying that I have nothing to disclose except that this is my opinion. I'm not here to represent the government, the Army, or the Walter Reed. So before I begin, I need to know if I'm preaching to the choir. How many people are in the military or have ever served in the military? Please raise your hand. Look at that. Keep, keep your hands up, please. How many people have a family member or close friend who's ever served in the military? Look at that. And then, and then lastly, who has a parent who ever served in the military? All raise your hands. This is the choir. These are your resources. Everyone here knows that the military culture is a unique culture where one picture doesn't tell the whole story. Majority of children are not cared for by those of us who wear the uniforms or those who are in military treatment facilities, but by you. And in the short time I have, I can't explain everything you need to know about the military culture any more than I could explain everything you need to know about caring for a black family or a Catholic family when they walk through your office. But I do have some things that I can tell you about. Things like Elias, this 12-year-old whose sister was deployed to Afghanistan and returned home safely, who experienced the anxiety of his sister being gone. But his needs are very different than Nico, whose father is an Annapolis grad in the medical field and will probably spend at least 20 years in the military. His needs are very different than Zoe and Noah whose dad was a White House fellow in the Bush administration, who already went to Rome, which I haven't been to yet, and whose father is a West Point graduate. One mold does not fit them all. One picture of military family is not enough, but I think there are two values that military families have that we all can agree upon. They are exposed to service and sacrifice. Angela and Tony, for me, represent the service component. They're part of the 7% of military families where both parents are in the military. But more importantly and more humbling, they represent those who signed up to serve after 9-11. When I joined, there was not a war. I'm humbled by the people who volunteer to serve this country knowing that they may be put into harm's way. That's what Angela and Tony represent. For the sacrifice, Sarah and her boys represent the two out of 700,000 who have a parent that were deployed. But there's still over a million more who weren't deployed. Nevertheless, military families still sacrifice. Whether it's the sacrifice of losing friends as a child or as a parent, changing schools, a parent being away for training episodes, or as a spouse, the sacrifice of a career or job opportunities. The whole family serves. It's not just the person who wears the uniform. That service is internalized. And for me, the people who represent this most, especially as an adolescent doc, which is near and dear to my heart, are those who join ROTC. My cousins, Aaron and Alexis, they grew up in a family, not necessarily military, but they were exposed to uh, service members, 
people in the armed forces, people in the police force, and they internalized the idea of service to their country enough where they would join ROTC. So with three stories, I want to emphasize what I think you as my civilian counterparts can do to help those who are in military families, because we know we can't take care of them all. The media, when they talk about people who've been injured, they'll typically stop at the loss of life or the loss of limb, such as with the Boston Marathon bombing, and they'll stop there. My friend and classmate from West Point, Greg Gatson, he is typical in many ways. He's proud of his service, and his family rallied together to, to embrace this new normal. But he is different in other ways. Greg and I were both in Iraq at the same time, 2006 to 2007. Different parts of the country, different cities, and very different jobs. I'm medical. He was in charge of a combat unit. Coming back from a memorial service with the loss of one of his soldiers, his vehicle hit an IED, an improvised explosive device, and he lost both his legs in 2007. His story doesn't stop there. This is where it becomes unusual. Because of a classmate, he was able to be on the sidelines for the New York Giants. He was able to give them inspirational talks. He was considered so much part of their 2011 Super Bowl win that they presented him with a Super Bowl ring after his amputation. That would be amazing in itself if it stopped there. But Greg is also in the movie Battleship. And probably the most impressive part is he became a base commander in charge of over 40,000 people. That's incredible, especially after the fact that most active duty people with an amputation are medically retired. The clinical paper put out this year by uh, Benjamin Siegel and Beth Ellen Davis is a great resource. If you haven't read it, it gives you a good background on what we can do for military families, for those not only deployed, but for those in service and those who have been injured. I bring up Greg as an example that it's not all tragedy. The service member's ability to adjust to their injury makes a huge difference to the family. Greg's story is remarkable. He and his family adjusted well. Those who have physical injuries often adjust better. You can see the, the loss. You can help them move through the process. Those who have the invisible wounds from traumatic brain injury, from post-traumatic stress disorder, the anxiety, the depression, they often have a more difficult time. Those are the families that we need to think about. If I, want you to, if I would ask one thing, is that you remember the picture of Greg. Remember that we can't be afraid to ask what's happened with a family. We should be able to find out what, source, what services are available, what the family can do, and how they're adapting to this new normal. The second story is about the four twins. I was fortunate to be a, a resident in Hawaii. As a senior resident in the NICU, the four twins were born at 33 weeks, Alex and Bryce. I was able to take care of them. I was able to be their continuity doc. Once they were discharged from the NICU, I cared for them until I was transferred to Germany for my next assignment. Fast forward 13 years. I saw them again in San Antonio. They had grown up to be normal 13-year-olds, had a little bit of asthma, they played sports, stayed out of the hospital mostly. They, of course, didn't know who I was. They didn't recognize me at all. But their mom gave me such a big smile and a hug and was so excited to see me that I felt un... un I didn't understand why, she meant, why I meant so much to her. What makes a difference in military families is that they are in a socialized medical system, the military socialized medicine. They are exposed to different providers. They had moved four times. They had seven different primary care doctors. They had seen specialists. Military children are a resilient group. 
Military families are used to a certain way of medicine. Now, they may hear that military medicine is better or civilian medicine is better. And like all of us, one or two bad experiences may color their impression. So what I would like you to remember with Alex and Bryce's story is that they're in the military. They're proud of their service. They say with pride, I was born in, in Hawaii and I have friends all across the country. And then lastly, Sergeant Smith's story highlights the medical home and some of the obstacles we have to have a medical home. Pediatricians, we have the job of being able to identify the sick child in a sea of normal and near normal children. It can be a difficult task. We also are there to support families with either their first child or whether this is a diagnosis that's completely alien to them. I'm not naive. I know that the time that you have with children is shorter and shorter. And being able to do all the things that a medical home requires, to be able to provide the, the accessibility, the continuity, the, the patient-centered, the comprehensive, the coordinated, the, the family-centered care is very, very difficult. But it is something that I think we can do if we emphasize the continuity. We know that if you see a family over and over again as a pediatrician, there may be something wrong. Sergeant Smith presented to the clinic three times in two weeks. Her complaint was, Jason's just not doing well. He was discharged the first two times with a diagnosis of a, a well, eight, well 13 month old and told to come back if anything changes. On the third visit, a, a doctor could very easily get frustrated. Why is this mother coming back to me? But those of us who've been practicing, we know that if a parent keeps coming back, maybe there's something else that we need to pay attention to. His primary care doctor asked the right question. Tell me what's going on in the military. She broke down into tears and said, I'm about to lose my benefits. My marriage isn't doing well, and I just don't know what the future is gonna be. By asking that question, we open up the door to take a social temperature, to find out what else is going on. In the military, we want to ask every time, is this visit related to a deployment? We're not excellent at that. We have our, our obstacles to doing that too. But what I ask for you is that if you have a patient who has a somatic complaint, who has anxiety, depression, or something that just doesn't make sense, and as their continuity doctor, you know that they're in the military. That's the time to ask, is this related to the military? Because we are loving QR codes this session, if you Google AAP deployment resources, you'll find a great web page that talks about the military culture. You'll find information about screening. You'll get information for providers, patients, and for parents. So lastly, the question of those of us in a uniform who are pediatricians are often asked, why does the military need pediatricians? The biggest reason is because when we're deployed, when we're not at home, the thing that sustains us is knowing that our family is taken care of. And for those of us who wear the uniforms, having been deployed, we can probably relate to those service members a lot better. What keeps the service members in the military is knowing that they're in a system that takes care of their family. What sustains me and keeps me wearing the uniform is knowing that my family is taken care of, and my hope is that there are enough providers who accept TRICARE, who see military families, like my dentist does. He says he does it as part of his service to military families. My hope is that there are enough providers to continue to do that. Because again, we can't do it alone. We need you. One of the proudest days of my life was when I returned home from Iraq, saw my family's smiling face, and realized that we made it through this together, but with the help of so many people around us. I have to thank Chad Mal and all of my friends who let me use their pictures. 
I'll expand upon this later today if anyone is interested in coming and talk about this. But I thank you so much for your time and attention. This is, this is a big problem. Thanks, that was cool. Thank you. Thank you.